everybody, to this episode of the Hot Rod Pod, Where It All Began. I am Brian Loans, lead broadcaster for the NHRA on Fox, and a guy who's been around the Hot Rod universe for about 20 years now because people keep hiring me to do freelance work and make unfortunate decisions like this. But this guy right here <laughs> is Hot Rod, the editor of Hot Rod Magazine, John McGann. We're talking to Bill Ganahl in this episode. Bill runs, uh, well, he's Pat Ganahl's son, who's yeah. a former editor of Hot Rod Magazine, plus he's uh, well accomplished on his own yes. right as a uh Top notch yeah. car builder in the country at this point. Uh, runs South City Hot Rods in um, Hayward, California, Bay Area. And uh, he is most known, I guess, this year for the striped paint job on the 34 Ford yes. that lit the world on fire at the Grand National Roadster Show. This was the car that was unveiled with barf bags at the Grand <laughs> National Roadster Show because they knew how polarizing the paint job would be. The one thing you have to know about Bill Ganahl is he has an, an, a degree in English literature and then went on to become a hot rod builder. So the fascinating part about this conversation to me, John, is we really get into the depth of the art of building a hot rod, mm -hmm. but also we get into the depth of the business of owning a hot rod shop, which is a, very, a, a fascination for me and maybe for mm -hmm. many of you as well. Lessons he learned along the way, uh, he, and he had a pretty good um, background working for Ray Brizio and and some and doing a lot of high end restoration work. And then he goes out on his own and realized like he basically <laughs> did nothing, and you know, and but he's made it work, and and his work is the work and the awards have have uh, proven that this year. So many people in the aftermarket and in hot rodding have opinions, but the fascinating thing about Bill is he has very strong opinions, but also has great context to back them up. This is a conversation that I expected before we began to have some depth, but I didn't know how deep in we would go, and it's something that I think people are really going to enjoy. It is, and uh, we mentioned it just briefly in the, the discussion, but um, he wrote his own feature for the car yes. in Hot Rod, and when he first approached me, and he mentioned that he, he was kind of happy to have uh, – written something in every magazine that his dad was involved with. But um, when he first approached me, it was something that, like, as a rule, I don't, you know. Yeah, you don't get to write your own stuff. That's no, what we're here like, for. <laughs> <laughs> you just take my job away from me. But I'm like, well, he's, he's Pat all son. I'm sure he could put a few words together in a coherent fashion. And he did. And uh, he does in this discussion, too. We know you're going to love this. David Freiberger was part of the discussion. And whenever the fire, the discussion needed a little gasoline dumped on top of the fire, uh, David was all too happy to provide it. Enjoy every word of the depth of hot rodding with Bill Ganahl. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Hot Rod Pod, where it all began. Bill Ganahl is our special guest, and I'm joined by the rest of the panel of inquisitors here, David Freiberger and John McGann. John, of course, the editor of Hot Rod Magazine. David Freiberger, a guy who, in his younger years, was the editor of Hot Rod Magazine, and then got old and graduated to the world of internet television. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I uh, haven't been doing much of that this week. And finally, <laughs> yesterday, I got a chance to walk around and see some of the show, catch up with some of the aftermarket folks. And uh, it's been a good time. John, what, would, what were you able to do once we got out of here yesterday for making our show with the Ring Brothers? Uh, I took a break. <laughs> you did? You, went, you just took a nap. Took a nap. nap. That's fun. Yeah. No, I had some work to do, so I was on the computer. Yeah, making all the content for HotRod.com. Yeah, yep, yep, yeah they've yep. got a full crew of people out here doing that. I see KJ, yeah, Hunkins. Yeah, yeah. 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 Got to feed the website, always. The yeah. beast. Got to feed yeah. the beast. So we're here with Bill, and, and you know, David, I think you should set Bill up because of the fact you guys you go way back multiple generations with this guy's family, basically. It's true. Um, I guess the, to, not to take away from what he's accomplished recently, because, Bill, you have been in the news big time recently with a couple cars you've built. The Good Guys Trendsetter Award just yesterday. And so I think when we talk about your dad, I think that is a big relevance for your background, but it's not the important no. thing about you. You understand what I'm trying I've to say? I've been riding his coattails since uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. That's what I'm trying to avoid. Right? And his dad yeah. is, of course, Pacanal, who was just a legendary journalist, a huge inspiration to me. He was the editor of, uh, was he the editor of Street Rotter or on the staff at Street Rotter? No, edi editor eventually, yeah. Right, editor yeah. eventually, and then he went to Sunset Magazine, oddly yeah. enough. I think a lot of people don't realize that. No. And uh, came back, was on staff of Hot Rod Magazine, was the editor of Hot Rod for about 35 minutes. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which there's some good stories behind that as well. He brought back Rod and Custom from the dead. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the reason he was just a hero to me is because he was so straightforward. He did the things that management didn't want him to do. Yep. His attitude attitude was always, I'm here for the audience, not for the company, not yeah, for the management. To a fault. Yeah. To a fault, mm -hmm. yeah, more so. Yeah. And I've got to tell the story about the wake, which was like the greatest wake I've ever been to. And uh, Bill's there, and his t-shirt says... <laughs> was my dad a to you? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? He could be. My favorite story was... Uh, 
do you have a house painter pinstripe this thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he would say things like that to people. Yeah. And um, I don't know if I told you this story. Maybe I did that night. That when I interviewed to be on staff of Hot Rod Magazine, it was actually with Jeff Smith for Hot Rod and with Pat for Rod and Custom. And uh, I, it was like two or three months between the interview and when I finally got hired. And Pat later told me, he's like, I kept telling Smith, if you don't hire this guy, I'm going mm, to. Yep. And eventually that's what forced Jeff to hire me at Hot Rod. So my dad created the yeah. uh, illusion of scarcity for you. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. He created the, d the demand and the uh, yeah. deadline. Yep. Yeah. And so not only did he inspire me as a kid, but also a very big part of getting me that job and mentoring me while I was doing it. Rod and Custom, which was him, yes. was right down the hallway from where I sat outside of Gray Baskerville's office, who was obviously another huge influence in my life. And he would come by and, and bust my chops all the time. I'm sure he was a great mentor if you did everything exactly as he said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So you seem familiar with this process. I've had 45 years of uh, yeah. mentoring. In quotes. <laughs> well, the one I'll give you it, before we move on to more cogent subjects. Uh, when David stepped away from the magazine in 2008, Rob Canan took over as the editor. So Rob has this big meeting, and I, he invites basically everybody that was a freelancer to his house. And so I end up going to Rob's house for like a week, basically living on his couch. And so as the day comes for the meeting, here comes your father, here comes Dave Wallace, here comes all these people that it's like I don't even belong within 100 yards of these guys, and I'm sitting in the same room with them. And so as we're going around the room, kind of pitching these different stories, get to your dad, and he said, listen. He said, I opened the magazine last month, and there was this pile of Mustang, and I thought, oh, God, this is my story. And, <laughs> no. and just proceeds to just augers it into the ground. Oh, no. And, and so I'm like, and so, of course, Robbie and Rob, he looks at me and he says, do you have a rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I looked at your dad. I said, well, okay, take the car away. What about the words? He says, you know, the words are actually okay. I said, I'm fine here then. We're, there you we're go. We're here. good. And, it, and, you know, to me, it, he, was a, he was a guy who had standards, and, and, the, and I had no problem with that. And that car, to him, had no business being in that magazine. Yep. And, and I think that is, to me, one of the endearing things that I look back and what he accomplished and everything and why I respected him so much is the fact that he did have a standard. And, and I don't think a lot of people, not to say that there's no standard anymore, but to defend it that vehemently, I think was a really cool thing. Brought to you by the guy who also did Caddy Hack. Right. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but Caddy Hack, which was a story in Hot Rod Magazine about taking a big Hankin Cadillac mm -hmm. sedan, throwing all the staff in it, making it as heavy as they possibly could, running it down the drag strip, and then progressively taking parts off of it until it was nothing but a bare frame going down the track. And there was a lesson in that, which was obviously light makes yeah. might, you know, speed out the of weight. The thing ended up running like 12s, and it was a floor pan with a steering wheel and a four-point <laughs> yep. roll bar. It was unbelievable. I, I, think, I think 12s is a little uh, <laughs> uh, uh, of a hyperbole. Yeah, it is a little bit. One, one thing he couldn't get it to do was go slower than his daily driver 1960 bug. <laughs> you know, which was another awesome thing about him is that at least as far as I know, he never had a brand new car. Never. He, he no. was always driving the older projects. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the iconic yep. 56 Ford. Yeah. Yep. And all the, the cow bugs. It was funny to watch him fold himself out of a cow <laughs> bug. I yeah. look back, and I don't know how he fit in that thing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. For the people who have never seen Pacanal, he was known as Too Tall Ganal. It was He's had to have been 6'6". 6'8". 6'8"? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He was 6'8 in his younger days. I think he kind of was yeah. getting a little yeah. shorter as he grew older. <laughs> but, yeah, no, he's a tall dude. Yeah. But, but look, let's let's move on to the current and the present. And, and the real reason we wanted to have you here as a guest this week as we get this series started. And, you know, David talked about the headlines that you've been in really constantly. I mean, it's it's been – you've built a lot of very cool stuff. But when we look at the truck you, you guys got awarded for at the, at the truck show this year, of course the coupe they were going to talk about. And – these are not these are things that are they're conversation starters in the best of ways right these are not things people look at and, and just go oh yeah that people have opinions on this stuff and i think that's a really important part of why we want to have a conversation because you've got great opinions as well oh i do yeah I'm, the <laughs> apple didn't fall too right. far from the tree right. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to kick it off i mean where do you want to begin the trendsetter award is a big one and that that was just kind of revealed to you last night but you said everybody else was in on it yeah, well, this is, I mean, I'm still not sure this really happened. You're catching me the morning after uh, it, it was awarded to me. Yeah, it, I mean, the good guys have done a lot for me over the years. Uh, winning awards, unfortunately, is necessary in this business. Um, and, you know, they've bestowed a, 
a lot of them on me. And, and very recently, I mean, we, we just won two top 12s in the same year, which is, uh, I mean, I don't, I'm glad they did it, but, uh, you know, I'm still stunned. Um, well, and to be clear for the audience, your business is South City Rod and Customs yes. building hot rods. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. But so, you know, getting the, the Trendsetter Award, it's kind of ironic, actually, because we build traditional, very traditionally inspired cars, you know. I, I and, was going to ask you about that. Yeah. It, it's strange that they would identify that as somebody setting a trend when <laughs> really you're perfecting a trend that's been around since the dawn of hot rodding. Well, I, I take it as a huge compliment because I'm trying to make tradition relevant in the modern context of, of the business here. And if you look at SEMA right now, I can count on one hand how many early hot rods there are here. Oh, I yeah, mean, it's, it's I, true. And so to now be to stand out because we're building traditional hot rods is weird. Yeah. I'm 45, yeah. you know, so I'm at a at a kind of middle ground of age groups of people who are into custom cars. And I use custom cars as like a blanket term of sure. anything that's custom. And you know, I just I just went from Wooler Rock, the Gathering at the Rock, which is a very small, very traditional show. And if you went there, you feel like traditional, very traditional hot rodding is alive and well and flourishing. Mm -hmm. And then the next week I'm coming to SEMA <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the only <laughs> traditional car in the entire building, you know. But to, to be able to say that I'm a trendsetter, I don't know, and I'm not arrogant at all, I just you know, I would not have given me that award. <laughs> but if I have any reason to accept it, you know, I'm proud to say that we are continuing tradition into the modern uh, culture of hot rodding. And I want to keep it alive. I feel like it's part of my uh, duty, you know, if anything for my dad, part of keeping on the legacy of people who've come before us. Um, and I consider it kind of a mission, really, you know. Um, nine out of ten people who look at the cars we build probably don't know very much anymore about what the inspiration for how they look even is but if they can engage with it and start a conversation about them then it's kind of keeping a little bit of that alive and, and in the conversation so I'll, I'll take credit for that why do you think that they have become so noticed well Kobe's car is just it's it's impossible not to notice. Right. Th this is the <laughs> yeah. car that we're talking about that came out a few years ago in bare metal. It's a 33 or 4? It's a 33 body with a 34 grill, so we call right. it a 34 because the grill really identifies it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And it was in bare metal, had an early Hemi in it, stack injection, big setback, zoomies, yeah. looked like a vintage drag car with a modern twist on the thing. Yep. And most recently, they painted the thing in what is the headline news. It's sort of an outrageous stripe I don't even know how to describe it. Kind of yeah. a strobe stripe. It, it, strobe yeah. stripe in yeah. multiple colors yeah. of mm -hmm. earth tones. Orange, brown, gold, copper. It was inspired by 70s, uh, you know, late 60s, yeah. early 70s psychedelic paint jobs. Uh, it's, a, it's, not, it's not really far on the spectrum of a psychedelic paint job, but that's what, what, right. what its inspiration was, and it's definitely far enough to make people talk about it. There was many cars back then that were striped that way. Absolutely. I, th I think of the Carroll Shelby Don Perdome top fuel car, red, yep. white, and yep. blue striped exactly. that way. Yep. I think uh, Crazy Cuda might have been that way. Yep. There was a station wagon I can think of that had just a bunch of vertical stripes on it. Yep. So as you talk about how you're building on tradition, I think a lot of people looked at that car, and as you said a few moments ago, they had no idea where that was coming yep. from mm, yep. and didn't get that context. Not at all. Uh, the, the biggest reaction was, why the hell would you put stripes on this car? And the, you know, Kobe, the owner, Kobe Gewertz, is a artist and a, he's a, does graphic design. And is incredible at it. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's, he's uh, brilliant. And, but he comes, he comes at the hot rod uh, at, as a piece of art. Um, and like Robert Williams, you know, with Prickly Heat, uh, which we talked about a lot while we were doing the car, you know, it, it's an ob object of art and it's a canvas, but putting those stripes on the car, you know, one of the comments we got a lot was, why would you put stripes on this car? It, it fights the lines of the body. And that was literally the point. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, that was, was that say. was, <laughs> yeah. right. that was, that was the whole juxtaposition and the reason for doing it. Uh, and if people don't understand it, we knew people weren't going to, uh, that all people weren't going to understand it. 
So well, you displayed it first at Grand National Roadster Show with barf bags. We put barf bags <laughs> out because so we were yeah. we were in Joe Campani's paint shop, you know, laying out the stripes, and I think you know we were just having fun and, and laughing and and Joe Campani walks out of the paint booth and he just out of nowhere goes, we should give barf bags to people who don't like it. And Kobe and I looked at each other and we're like, oh, we're doing that yeah. for sure. <laughs> Yeah, so he, he designed a logo for him and and then signed him and gave him out to especially the people who didn't like the car. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And in, in, in the artistic sense, isn't isn't this isn't this the, the the goal of any artistic project is to create a piece that places that makes people look at it and think about it. And it does. It's not necessarily the point to make everybody love it, but it's it's I think great art, no matter what the form is causes people to look at it and either and make mm -hmm. it make a call on whether they love it or not well so for me personally to be the person to build this car is so far out of my comfort zone so far out of my typical style of build when people walk into my shop i i tell i've told a lot of people i've never painted a car more than one color before this wow i like uh subtle i like classy i like timeless and if you're going to build a car for x amount of hundreds of thousands of dollars yep. you don't want it to be you know uh, a joke in five years uh and some people want that you know some people want to come to sema if if you've got enough money to build a car every year yeah. then you can come and make a splash and then go put it in your garage and never see it again, and that's oh, sure. fine. And the, some people oh, the, do that. The graveyard of stuff that comes out of this show <laughs> yeah. and just is, is so <laughs> garish that yeah. it, I mean, it's thousands of cars over the years. Yes. Oh, there's pl so many, and and I don't want to build those cars. If somebody came to me and said, "I want to build a million plus dollar car just to win an award," I'd talk about it. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not closed minded to it, but it's just not my typical thing. I I really look at let's build a car that you can drive and in 20 years it's going to be as cool as it was today so kobe's car he really forced me into that uh realm and i just told, he kind of i i joke about this i i think in my mind kobe wanted it to be uglier and i'm using that with figure yeah. quotes than it turned out and some people might say it's as ugly as it can possibly be <laughs> and that's fine but uh, he was talking about doing vertical stripes on it and wider stripes, and he had some renderings done. And I looked at it, and I, I kind of, I think I said at one point, I was like, if if it's going to be ugly and come from my shop, it has to be good ugly, not bad ugly. And we just were very copacetic through the entire thing. And Kobe really, as an artist with a vision, he really let me and and Donnie and the guys at the shop add our own uh, influence to what the ultimate you know outcome was and i think we reached a a good happy medium with our intentions with the car sure. it's not ugly enough that i mean it was a risk it could have literally been a laughing stock and ruined my career you know i mean if you want to be extreme about right. it right you'll never work in this town again <laughs> yeah I, you know yeah. um and when we first debuted it at gnrs we pulled the cover off with a f with people filming it and it just went nuts with people just you know social media commenting either loving it or hating it we knew obviously we had the barf bags we knew it was going to be a talking point mm -hmm. but we had no idea how how uh you know serious people were going to be about the, <laughs> how much they hated the thing <laughs> uh and it could have gone either way i think at that point you know i i know you kept commenting on i would post like everyone hates it and i was I was not trying to hype that up. I'm a self-effacing person. So if I do something where I'm like nervous, people aren't going to like it. Like I make jokes and go. I laugh. Yeah. I'm tired of it as a marketing shtick. Right. It, it was great at the beginning, yeah. but I, I feel that it's just gone a little bit far because from what I see, the love outweighs the hate by quite a bit. Yeah, but you said too far. That was only like a couple weeks after. <laughs> it wasn't that long after. Yeah. And I've since stopped saying it. You know. yeah. It. it but but when it when it debuted, it was in in my the way I received the information that I got, it was fifty fifty for sure. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was it could have gone either way. If it didn't, uh, it may, being on the cover of Hot Rod magazine mm -hmm. just validated our choice big time, mm -hmm. you know. And it, that and then winning the Hot Rod of the Year with the good guys, mm -hmm. and and there's people now who come up to me. 
Ah, uh, when you unveiled that thing, I just, I don't know how I felt about it, but it's really kind of growing on me. Yeah. And my reaction to them yeah. is like, can I cuss on this thing? Yeah. 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 My reaction is, <laughs> you, you don't get to like this car. Yeah. Good. You know, I, I, I say that jokingly. I, I like that people are coming around and, and now it's probably 80, 20. You know, I really do feel like there's way more people that sure, like it. Yeah, they, people sure. come up to me all the time at shows. We've been touring the thing all year and it's been nuts, but... The big question is, you're the trendsetter of the year now. Does that mean people are going to start to do that? Yeah, when does the... Oh, because, yeah. Yeah. man, yes. you knock that off, and it's going to be... Pff, you just knocked off these guys. Yeah. So, it's so, so blatant if yeah. you were to pick up that idea. Two, so t- <laughs> two, two responses to that. One is at the Trendsetter Award banquet, my speech started off with, I promise that stripes are not going to be part of the trend. <laughs> uh, and... Number two, you know, I've even just here at SEMA, I had a guy come up and was just like, I've, I, I've saved the hot rod article. I've been looking at this. I want you to build me one of these. Wow. And my response was like, just like this? Because yeah. I'm not going to do that. Right. Yeah. But I don't know if somebody came and asked me to build something comparable that I would even do it because you can't do that twice. Yeah. No. You know, if, if you did it a second time, it would just be another one of those yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. um so <laughs> it, it he says thereby insulting everybody who's in their garage <laughs> building one right now <laughs> well yeah <laughs> well yeah i i don't want to discourage anybody from building what they want to build and i was having this conversation with somebody just here also you know hot rotting is supposed to be self-expression mm-hmm. and there's supposed to be no wrong answer mm-hmm. you're literally building what you want out of for whatever you, you want yeah. for you yeah. and if everybody hates it but you love it then that's fine what's the yeah who cares uh me as a builder i'm building stuff for other people and like i said earlier shows matter awards matter in terms of your reputation and building your credibility and uh does, so does that know. ethos that you just mentioned though still exist in the in the modern world because we've we've now trained ourselves that everything we do has to be projected out to everybody right so so a guy in his garage in, in 1960 in southern california is building his car for him and he's going to go out and drive it around and his circle of friends are going to see it and that's going to be it and mm-hmm. maybe one of his buddies likes it the other one doesn't but now this guy is going to build this thing and every flipping opinion is mm-hmm. going to be shared on it so well so and if you're going to be influenced by it and do it, you have to take it next level. That's yeah. the thing about social media. Everything's got to be bigger, yeah. better, yeah. faster, yeah. louder at every, yeah. every single step. And But there is also influence. Like, is Bob McCoy the 40 Ford with the flames yep. on the front? One of the best ones. Everybody did that after yeah. that yeah. car yeah, yeah, came yeah. out. Yeah. And so the influence could lead people to do variants of what you did with that car. Yes, and... The difference in my mind is that Kobe's car, you know, so the the stripes, painting a psychedelic paint job or stripes on a dragster was not to make the car look good, per se. Attract It was to make it Mm -hmm. gain attention. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about a trend that is just, hey, look at me, you know, I don't think that's a good trend. I think that what we did with Kobe's car was do that at the right time in the right place to shake things up Mm -hmm. in a way that kind of needed to be done. Not needed to. That sounds, you know, highfalutin. But, you know, it was a good time to do it. Mm-hmm. And I think it did a good thing because people are talking about traditional cars. They're talking about color. I, my hashtag was going to be, you know, make cars colors again. Yeah. You know, um, we're just in a, at a point where everything's muted earth tones and, <laughs> yeah. you, you know. Uh, we see a lot of earth tones this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's fine. You know, trends are trends. And, again, but, though, that's that's the – the paradox of hot rodding mm-hmm. is that you're building something for self-expression that's supposed to be unique and a, an expression of yourself, but then they all kind of start looking the same because everyone's like, I like that trend, and then they just sort of start building yep. the same thing. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're, I'm trying, you know, painting that, that 40 Ford pickup. That's what the, I was going to yes. transition to yes. because mm-hmm. you didn't pigeon, pigeonhole yourself with the coupe. You moved on to the 40 Ford pickup. Absolutely, and, and thank goodness <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> But, you know, the, the truck is way more along the lines of what I personally want to build. Not that I didn't, I mean, I wanted to build Kobe's car, and the, it's badass. I love driving that car more than anything we've built. It's mm-hmm. super fun. It's a hot rod. It's visceral. 
it's what a hot rod should be. The, I'm a, I like customs. You know, I came from more of liking customs, and then I got a job working for Brizio's building hot rods. Uh, and people don't build customs to the level that they do hot rods. So if you have a business, that's kind of what you need to do. But that truck is really kind of a, it's a mix of both, I think. It's, a, it's low in the front and has a hot rod look, but it's definitely a, a custom yeah. vibe to it. Well, it. And it ticks pretty much all the boxes you mentioned earlier, like the simplicity, the elegance. I mean, that is, that is to me, that's the really the defining feature of that truck it is it is as elegant really as you can make one of those things look and the beautiful beautiful curvature on the body of those things but the color all of it it's yeah well thank you first of all uh a 40 ford pickup you really can't screw up <laughs> i mean you can i've seen them screw I up can. <laughs> fair enough <laughs> yeah but you know they're just they're they're beautiful shapes right off the gate so whenever i look at a car I just look at what are the few things that I can change to accentuate what it already is, not to change it into something that it wasn't to start with. And we do a lot of work just doing subtle modifications on cars that most people don't know are done, but they look at the car and just think, wow, that's a good looking one of those. Yeah. And I tell my customers, I'm like, you're going to spend a lot of money on things that people aren't really going <laughs> to know happened. Uh, you know. And that truck's a perfect case in point. Again, though, you know, you can do all the work in the world and make the body look the way you want, you know, throw money at it. If you don't paint it the right color, yeah, it's all for nothing. And that truck's a, a perfect case in point of putting the right color on, on a body. You know what's a strange reaction I had to it is that, was it a 49 or a 50 Chevy that your dad built? 52. 52. Yeah. The 40 seems to me to be like the teal or aqua version of that orange color or peach color he had on that oh, car. Oh, you mean the 53 that he built for, for the magazine? That's it. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. He had a 52 himself. Yeah, no, the okay. 50, 53 that he built for the magazine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you see what I mean about how it sort of has the same color temperature or depth or yeah. something Oh, absolutely. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. in a different color? Right. I don't know. It's hard yeah. to describe in a design terms. Kobe would be able to nail what I'm yeah. talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. No, it yeah. is. It, I mean, and that's what we wanted was that kind of like, you know, it, it, we were thinking a little more 60s. I think my dad, when he was building that car, he put a color that worked for the 80s because right. that's when yeah. he was building it. But it was better than most of the peach Pastel. pastels yeah. that came yeah. out in that time. So Way. he rode the line pretty well with that, I think, and it did a great job at that time. Um, and we, that car went to, like, his yeah. cousin or something? Yeah. 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 We won't. I won't uh, go into any of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cool. He was he was bummed that that car yeah. you know kind of went away and and oh I did hear that rant y yeah, okay. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's one of his rants yeah 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 yep. yeah but anyway the forty one the forty pickup you just built won America's most beautiful truck the right. world's yeah. 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 world's yeah. most beautiful <laughs> truck <laughs> don't Greg the owner will let you know it's world's, <laughs> world's most not world's. America's it's <laughs> world's so they so first of all they it's uh, Grand National Roadster Show that we do every year, have a booth. It's one of the best indoor car shows in the country, I would That's say. Great. Uh, they saw the, uh, you know, the popularity of trucks mm -hmm. and realized that trucks have a lot of shows, but they don't really have a good indoor type show that's like GNRS. So that's the niche they were trying to fill. Uh, and we just, I went because they said, hey, Bill, can you bring some trucks? And I had like seven trucks in the all local that I could bring. So I chose out of those and we brought four <clears throat> and I could only fit three in my booth. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so I just said to Greg, why, why don't we put it in for the WMBT? W Worlds is, they said that they did that because they wanted, uh, they didn't want it to be just American trucks. I see. Uh, so okay. it's not technically that they're really saying it is the most in beautiful the truck world. in the world. They just <laughs> wanted to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. But Greg thinks that it's because it's the most beautiful truck in the world. And so do we, really. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But, no, we were lucky to go to the inaugural show. It was very good. But, of course, it's a new show, so it's yeah. going to grow and, and get better over time. We snuck in and, and snagged the first one, yeah. <laughs> basically, is what happened. I mean, and, and we're – talk about a show – I mean, SEMA is kind of the same way. You're, it's apples to oranges. Like, how do you judge 
yeah. a 40 Ford pickup against a square body C10, sure. against a four by four, against an international, you know, I mean, it's just, <clears throat> they were all over the place. And we were, I would say, lucky that the judges appreciated traditional, mm -hmm. you know, styling. But the truck, the most arrogant I will get is to acknowledge that I believe that truck is beautiful. Yeah. I really do. It's one of my favorite cars, vehicles that we've mm -hmm. built, and it just, the color, like I said, it's a 40 Ford pickup. You can't screw them up. But you can perfect it. Well, yeah. if, it, yeah. if, if, if anybody thinks that, I'll, I will take that as a huge yeah. compliment. Yeah. One of the things you and I had spoken about on the phone a couple months ago is, it's interesting you say that you're all about tradition, but you also look at some of the big awards and you're like, this car breaks no new ground. It just, it's won an award, but there's nothing special about it. I think the judges are rivet counters in that case, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. they're, they're looking at lining up all the screws, and you're like, I want uh, uh, something that makes a statement that has some pizzazz, mm -hmm. yet at the yeah. same time you're fighting for traditional hot rods. Well, yeah, so we're building, I, I don't know that I should be throwing out numbers here because you know I, I always get self-conscious, especially when we come to somewhere like SEMA. There are millions of dollars builds here. Yeah. For millions sure. and you know we all the guys in the industry you see something win and everyone's like yeah how much do you think that one cost to build <laughs> right? Right. and then you hear numbers like going all the way from 1 million to like 10 billion and you're like well it's somewhere in there <laughs> <laughs> but you know my cars so far have been i build driver driver cars and i don't mean they're door slammers i mean you know they're they're drivers i build them to work to function, I want my customers to drive them. That's what cars are for. Mm -hmm. And I'm not building million dollar cars to compete for an award. I'm, but what I'm trying to do is build a car that I can put in competition for one of these awards against million dollar cars and it's not gonna be laughed out of the competition. Mm -hmm. And I've somehow, with the people who are around me, Campani Color painting the cars, Chris Plant uh, doing the interior, Danny DJ Designs doing the interior, Everybody just has helped me up the level of our cars for what I consider a bargain for the customers I'm building them for. Mm. And a bargain, that's still hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sure. Uh, and, but to come here and compete, like Kobe's car made the top 40 at SEMA, you know, and there's people here with million plus dollar cars who didn't get in or probably pissed. Yeah. But, but we're, to your point, we're building cars that are visually exciting or so good looking uh, you know, hypothetically, <laughs> that they can't ignore them and not at least engage with them in the conversation about awards. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. I, I like, you know, I, I feel self-conscious because I don't want to be the guy who comes in and steals an award for someone who spent $2 million to win that award and are pissed that we did it. Yeah, that hurts your feelings, I know. <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it really tears you up. But on the flip side of that, on the flip side of that, if that's the case, if, if it simply comes down to the fact of he who spends the most wins the most, then, then the whole thing's just invalidated right. anyway, right? I mean, right. And the whole thing just literally becomes flim-flam. And some people would say that that's the way it is, yeah. literally. I mean, there are certain shows, if you're going by points, I mean, it's what happened to the AMBR, you know, in, in the 70s when cars just got crazy. A lot of car shows were how many things can you change on this car, not how can you make it better, how many things can you change. And so people would come one year, they'd lose, so they'd go home and just change another 20 things on the car, <laughs> add things, yeah. not, not take away. <laughs> and that's how we got Mercedes headlights in, you know, yeah. 52 Chevys. Yeah. It, it's, oh, yeah. I don't miss that. No, well, it, it's still happening. Is it? <laughs> All right. I, I would say I won't name the shows, but there are certain shows where, I mean, that's still really what's going on. Yeah. You know, we, we joke that the ugliest car often wins. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. and, and again, that's very subjective and opinionated what's ugly. But, you know, I, I feel like there are no, like I said earlier, there's no rules, but there are rules, you mm -hmm. know, and different people in different niches have different concepts of what those rules are. Yeah. I'm very opinion, you know, I'm traditional. So if I, I can go out and appreciate a Ring Brothers, you know, weird truck for the craftsmanship, you know, and it may not be aesthetically what I like at all, but you know, I'm a builder, so I can go look at anything and be yeah. like, wow, that's a crazy thing they did right mm -hmm. there. Yeah, the execution. And the execution yeah. and the craftsmanship is just insane. 
but I have a very specific idea of what I want them to look like. Mm -hmm. And that's more important than how much it costs, how many modifications. I mean, like I said, I'll build stuff that has a thousand modifications on it that nobody's even going to know happened. Yeah. And I'm fine with that as Would long as they think it looks good. Car? I'm doing one right now. What is it? Uh, so we're doing a 68 Charger. First of all, I did build a 65 GTO before, and it was kind of a driver, so it didn't really get a lot of attention. But it, made, it was on the cover of Street Rotter. Uh, but oh, behind a 34 that. Ford, it was the first uh, muscle, muscle car, car that was oh, on the cover of Street Rider. Yeah. Yeah, when they expanded I've, the yeah. Major, I'm yeah, pissing yeah, yeah. people off every step of the way. Yeah. Yep. yeah. But yeah, so we're doing a 68 Charger uh, that we're hoping to get done for the Sloniker uh, at, at GNRS in three right. months. So I don't know why I'm here right now, first of all. <laughs> yeah, you're busy. Yeah. Um, and it it's a step outside of the stuff that we typically do, but. I'm also, I have to be cognizant of staying relevant, but I want to build the Charger. It's going to be a South City styled Charger. You know, it's not going to be a um, pro touring. It's not going to have 3D printed valances and spoilers and <laughs> on it. Yeah. Which I'm not saying disparagingly. I'm just sure. saying it's, it's, not, it's, your not, not, your, it's not our style. So we, we had EVOD uh, do wheels, custom wheels for it, but I picked a Polara hubcap. Uh huh. Nice. And it's going to yeah, look cool. like a very, you know, original, like it could have cool. come. So it's going to be, stock plus yeah. but it's not going to be uh it first of all it's not going to be a million dollar car it yeah. might be close but uh you know it's going to be one color <laughs> um it's going to have a uh danny from dj designs is doing the interior so where we're really stepping out on this one is that we're going to do a modern traditionally uh, with inspiration from the stock but uh it's going to be all cad rendered 3d printed uh, C and seed, so that's where it's going to be a, a step away from the norm for me. But I'm excited to do it. And so to answer your question, if somebody came and said they wanted to build a Pacer or a Gremlin or something, like I, <laughs> right. I would find a way to make it a South City <laughs> car and to make it as cool. As long as the check cashed, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like a car, I, I do, I do it sometimes when the check doesn't cash. Yeah, <laughs> well, that actually brings up another point I think we wanted to talk about, which is, I mean, your dad built cars in his garage. You work for Brizio. Is it worth owning your own shop? Should a kid oh, who's oh, loves before, before yes. we go all the way down yeah. that rabbit hole, yep. one, one question <laughs> just to finish up the point on the Charger. It, the Charger would strike me as the type of car that attracts that. That's the type of car to me that makes the phone ring at your shop, right? Because of just, you know, we walk around, we looked at the Ring Brothers Charger, like mm -hmm. not to use the same model, but we look at what they're doing. The 32 gets a, a, an insane amount of attention, and maybe the one guy calls up and says, I want one just like it. But when you build this Charger that you're doing, to me, that, that strikes such a wide, throws such a wider net on a potential customer base. Is there any risk in all of a sudden? The muscle car calls start coming in so fast that it's like, ah, am I going to send myself down away? Because obviously you're conscious of how you want your shop to produce stuff, what the range of stuff you want it to produce. That's, so, that's something that I think about constantly. Uh, running, you know, the, the tug of war between running a business and being an artist <laughs> is real and it's yeah. difficult uh the identity of your sh i call our shop identity crisis hot rods <laughs> <laughs> because you know i mean over the years i really have done in a, a you know a yeah. disparate variety of cars we built one of the first c10 pickups that was done to like a really high level the mafia truck uh that we built for sean provost who then took it and started his own shop using that truck as his poster child for his shop not bitter at all, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but no, it, but it was a really fun build because it was totally out of the. It was a seventy C ten, yeah. and I'm like, well, let's make. He came and kind of was just like, Bill, what do you want? Let, do what you want with it, you know. So we built it very with subtle modifications, yeah. but really nice for a C ten at that time. I think we were kind of head of the well, uh, half. A ironically, step we were like at the forefront <laughs> of, but that was just because Sean brought us that sure. truck. Um, but afterwards. I mean, I joke that he, I mean, I don't, it's not a joke. He really took it and, you know, used it as, as fodder to start his own shop. I would have been upset if that's what I wanted to build. I see. But because it was sort of a one-off deal, I mean, I literally didn't even, I've never even spoken this out loud before. You, you were know? emotionally attached to the work to make sure the work was done correctly, but you weren't emotionally attached to what it ended up being. And I might be dumb for not having pushed that, you know, more because 
we do get calls for trucks and we've done a few we've done a couple patina uh, trucks a couple of really nice uh, c10s but to me i just look at the car and the the my vision of it is comes always from the same place you know so it doesn't really matter what the car is and if we have to do more muscle cars in the future i i don't dislike muscle cars yeah, at sure. all and if somebody will let me do it the way i I or at least have my input, then I'm all for it. And and that's why we're doing it. I mean, you know, putting this yeah. in the Sloniker's, I don't think it's going to win the Sloniker, period. Uh, but it'll be putting our name on that type of build. And I don't want those to be all the calls we get. Right. But if it's some of them and, and we start sure. doing some of those, that's, that's great. Yeah, going back to what I was asking about, about just running the shop, and that's one of the considerations is you get to pick your customers at some level. Well, that's the goal. Yeah. You, know, you, you build up to being able to be discretionary. <laughs> uh, but you came into this with a passion, and now you're running a business in California and dealing with yeah. you know, just Air Resources Board and whoever else. I, would you do it yeah. again, or would you continue working at somebody else's oh, shop? Oh, man. So when I worked for, I worked for Roy Brizio for 14, 13 or 14 years. Wow. And that's tough to say because I really weaned off. I started working four tens and then I went down to three days a week and I was moonlighting at my shop and built four or five cars while I still worked for Roy. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, you know, Billy, do you really, I don't, do you know what you're getting <laughs> into? Yeah. 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 This is the story I was trying to trigger. <laughs> yeah. He, you know, Roy, a lot of guys start at shops and, and then leave and do their own thing, and it happens. And a lot of the times it creates rifts between sure. the mm -hmm. employer and, and the guy who mm -hmm. went on their own. Roy, I call him my Bay Area dad. Like, he's just been supportive of me while I worked at his shop. I learned everything. I, I mean, most of what I know there. Obviously, I grew up in car culture, but uh, he, was, he started sending me work when I went on my own. I chopped a bunch of tops for him, did metal work, and, and uh, he was super gracious. Today, I've heard him, he's been in interviews for Hot Rod and different magazines mm -hmm. and has literally shouted out that I, you know, I'm one of the guys who's carrying on hot rodding in, the, in his opinion in the right way, right. <laughs> you know. Um, so, but yeah, the answer, sorry, I'm <laughs> never going a, a straight a line <laughs> to the answer yeah no the, but the answer is is yes i would do it again because i just want to build my cars you know i, I want to build what i want to build mm -hmm. and i got to do awesome work at roy's he let me do all the rest like in addition to building cars he let me do all the r historic restoration stuff yeah. there i got to restore the jack calori 36 mm -hmm. one of the raddest customs of all time and one of the lesser known ones too, but uh, the Sam Barris Merc I got to restore. Wow. Yeah. I got to restore the a la carte. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and kind of re-restore the McMullen Roadster. I mean, I got to work on just pinch me amazing cars. Mm -hmm. And I'm literally pulling panels off and seeing where Sam Barris, you know, put lead on yeah, them. You know, it's wild. nuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just, I was, you know, 27, 26 or seven when we took the, Calori car to Pebble Beach and won uh -huh. our, the class as a 27 year old. I mean, I was just like drinking beer and, you know, <laughs> around all these, you know, snotty, you know, <laughs> Americans speaking with a British accent. And I'm just like <laughs> pounding beer. And I'm like, <laughs> it was, I mean, some great, great experiences. Um, and, and there's something to be said for just getting a paycheck. Yeah. That's steady. And you go home mm. at five and don't think about, business until you get there at eight the next day i you know running a business is a 24 hour yeah. seven day a week uh job and you have responsibilities you know we got guys working at the shop that now i'm like you know i i can't just cut and run if i want you know there's yeah, this guy's got a family this guy's gonna mm -hmm. feed his kids yeah, yeah. and and they're fa they are family to me too you know they're uh, everyone it's cliche but you spend more time with them than yeah. your family you know uh your real family sometimes and uh me to a fault <laughs> when you look back like especially when you're first getting yourself established on your own two feet and you have you know you have that i don't call it a safety net but you have that stability of the regular job what if, what mistakes did that allow you to avoid what did what did the experience at brizio's allow you to avoid failing on early that sinks a lot of guys well 
just the transition from working at, you know, I never jumped in feet first to having my own business because like I said, I, I started working a little less and a yeah. little less. So I had that at least small, smaller and smaller paycheck, yeah, yeah. but something to like, be like at least pay some of the rent. And Roy never said, Billy, it's one or the other. You know, he never said that. He let me go build a car that won custom of the year while I was working for him. Yeah. You know, and not to say that that's if I was building 32 Fords, maybe he would have been a little, <laughs> yeah. a Good little point. less uh, encouraging. But um, but, you know, I, I almost think if I had built 32 Fords, he would have encouraged me. Um, I mean, he told me he's he gave me plenty of advice. He said, uh, you know, w when I worked for him at the peak, he had 16 employees there and he basically said it's not worth it whatever little bit more money you make from it, which is not, it doesn't equal the number of employees you have. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Diminishing returns. It's diminishing returns. Yeah. And he's, he's like, if you do this, you want to have four or five, six guys. He's like, that's the sweet spot. You know, so he gave me advice like that, that was invaluable. And I didn't even know how valuable it was at the time. I was just like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right, sure, yeah. And now, you know, however many years into it, over a decade on my own, it's all absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, and, and also I learned some things not to do from him. You know, he, he like anybody, he's got his, you know, very specific vision of how to run a shop and, and not that it's wrong. It's yeah, just some it's of the his. things are, yeah, the, like I don't want to do that that yeah. way. And so I, I don't, I'll tell the really short story of how I got the job at Brizio's. I went to, I moved to San Francisco to go to college and the only, you know, everybody thinks I was born with a silver spoon and that I'm here because of my dad. My dad didn't help me in much any way, shape or form, even at home. You know, he didn't teach me how to weld. I would go out and when he wasn't in the garage, mm -hmm. light up the oxyacetylene and waste all the gas. And then he'd come and be pissed because he's like, <laughs> where's my, <laughs> where's my, uh, my oxyacetylene. But, um, uh, I, he told me to go, he's like, I know Roy, just go in and ask if for a summer job, pushing a broom, driving the shop truck, whatever. Yeah. It might be a fun job to have rather than working at a Starbucks. Sure. And so I did, and it just happened to be the week that his uh, shop parts driver had quit. Perfect. It was, per it, and he's like, hired. If that guy hadn't have been leaving, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have gotten that job at Roy's. And if I hadn't gotten that job at Roy's, I'd be an English professor right now. I mean, literally, that yeah. might be the one little thing that... Is that what you're going to college for? Being a... Uh, like an English major? Classic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I studied literature. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's hilarious. But not, yeah, I mean, I wanted to be a writer, and I think I probably would say at the time I wanted to be a writer, and I'd probably, you know, teach English, mm -hmm. at, you know, as a day job. But through college, I started working for Roy and he almost immediately let me start working on cars. I drove a shoebox Ford, a 50 Ford and Oh, I remember that car. Yeah. yeah. I drove I put probably over 200,000 miles on wow. that car. Daily driver for a long time. And a guy had a 50 Ford and Roy's like, "You got one of these. This guy wants to lower it. Can you do it?" And I was like, "Yeah." I've yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I mean, he really just let me work right off the bat, uh, which was again, you know, just lucky very very nice of him you know to do that uh and i got the bug you know and started instead of taking english or history courses started i took metallurgy courses i found a tig welding class that i could take nice and so by the time i graduated i was like screw this <laughs> I, I, <laughs> right. and also through college saw like the bureaucracy of it and like how it wasn't what i thought you know naively as a kid and i'm like hot rodding is way more fun Mm -hmm. And my family growing up was a do what you love, not mm -hmm. what makes money. And clearly that's been the case. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that was actually kind of led into a question I wanted to ask you. And, and you mentioned the, the na naivete to some degree of how things work. And, and you're so grounded in, in how you explain things and how you've laid your business out. But everybody has a picture in their head. So 10 years ago, does the picture you had had in your head 10 years ago for what South City was going to be match what South City is? Not a bit. <clears throat> Even starting off on my own, I don't think I ever had a plan. Okay. I, I would have been happy working by my, I was a one-man shop for, yeah. for many years. 
and I'm an only child. Uh, I, I have some of the traits of an only child, and one of them is I'm super comfortable being by myself. I'm probably on the autism spectrum. I can just sit, I have so much patience, I can just sit there and work on something for hours and hours. And I'm happy when I'm doing that. But I, the business side of things, in California, you can't rent a shop and work by yourself and make any money whatsoever. Mm. So I realized that I needed to get employees. Yeah. I had one to start with. And it just kind of snowballed, like without any intention. That sweet spot of four to five, yeah. six guys, that's where I've ended up. And it wasn't intentionally. It's just naturally how things landed it's really hard to find employees oh, i can't imagine i can't imagine yeah and and in california it's even worse because you're fighting how much overhead you have versus trying to pay guys a living wage yeah. to do what we do that's not taught in schools like right. so you need artisans and craftsmen too or this is this is a the pool is already this small and you keep shrinking it and they can <clears throat> they can go a, they could go be a union plumber and make as much or more <laughs> maybe than right. what we do. And B, they could go do it in their own garage and make more than what they don't know that they're really not going to make. Right. You know, <laughs> right. they're like, I could go charge $75 an hour in my garage. You know, and they think they're making $75 yeah. an hour. Yeah, it doesn't no. work that way. But, um, but you're fighting all of those, uh, you know, factors. So I've just really gone where luck and, and, serendipity takes me um i'm really really lucky uh to have a core good core group of guys working at, at the shop uh it's a good vibe it's a fun environment uh the reason why my voice is hoarse is that we just went out and uh celebrated together last good. night you know we can go do that and yeah. it's really fun even the Campani color does our paint he's a separate business but he worked for rizzio's with me and we both sort of went on our own at the same time so we've been together he's painted almost everything that i've built uh chris plant and now danny chris plant has done a lot of my interiors now danny from dj designs moved into our complex so we have paint builder and interior all uh, literally cool. in the That's same complex cool. yeah it reminds me of uh tony nancy and who was the chassis shop immediately next was door it, to it was don lawn next was it no lawn? uh shoot. i know exactly who you're talking about but what do you uh, no it was in the valley yeah but you know, it, it is the same basic situation. Yeah, it's like you're all you, you just need to go to this one <laughs> driveway, and mm -hmm. you can get and pretty you can much fill anything. it all out. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to start like a Chrome shop there, and we'd be set. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no more Chrome shops in yeah, California. No. So right. That's illegal right. now too. Yeah. <laughs> Roy Roy tried. Did he? I don't. Most people probably don't know it, but he uh, started a Chrome shop for a couple years in the middle of his long career, mm -hmm. and it flopped so hard <laughs> that he just bailed on it and used you know sherms or whoever from then on but yeah it uh, fuller oh, Kent Ken, fuller, Ken yeah, fuller. Yeah, yeah, okay yeah, yeah yeah yep yep you know i think in any career and I, even in my own life maybe you guys too it's like you have these visions of stuff and it's like when i hit this plateau i'm gonna know i made it you know and, and everybody has this vision right. of like the balloons fall out of the ceiling and it's like the you get showered yeah when's that coming for you brian well that's, well, that's <laughs> the point that's the point right and that the point to me the, the at least in my own life when when you uh, you make it somewhere you achieve something or you you get this moment that you've created in your head is like oh when this happens and then you get there and it's like oh you know, now kind of on to the next one. Is it the same for you in the sense of when the when the shop's getting going, when the business is starting, it's like, all right, when I land this or when this award comes my way, this is going to be the thing. But the satisfaction maybe isn't necessarily getting the thing, but what follows? I don't know if there, if you're satisfied, then I don't know what motivation you have to get mm -hmm. up in the morning. Um, I really... I take, I try to take all of the awards and, and magazine footage coverage with a very healthy uh, humility because you, you take it when you can and it's super fun. It's amazing. You know, the first time I got a car on the cover of a magazine, I, it was one of those moments yeah. where I'm like, oh my God, you know, it, it just was surreal. But you realize real quick that the next day you got to get up and go into the shop yeah. and, and work again, yeah, no. you know. So these moments are, are little and, – and I'm the kind of guy who, like, I, I keep telling everybody that this year 
has to be the pinnacle of my career. Like it can't go up from here. It's all just downhill from here on out. <laughs> that is very Freiburger, by the way. That is, is, a, that is a Freibergerian outlook. Yeah, the program. Program. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, but but it also keeps you on your toes too. You know, I, I don't. I, I really just want to go build cars. I love cars. I just from being a kid. You know, the fact that I ended up doing it for a living making a hobby into your business is it kills your hobby in a certain way yeah. and not entirely, but it changes it sure. entirely. And so building my own stuff is just like, I'm old. I feel old at 45, even doing what we do. My dad kept telling me, he's like, you're, you're not going to be able to walk, you know, by the time you're 65 and, and it might be true. Uh, but you know, I, I don't, I've built one car for myself in the past, like over 10 years. Um, and I enjoy, like I said, I'm on the autism spectrum. I, I love just going in and working on things and it doesn't bug me too much that I have to give them away when we're done. I'm really lucky that our customers let me, a lot of them are local so I can go say, Hey, you know, Mark or whoever, can I borrow the truck for this show? Or Tony Gerardo just let me drive his 40 Ford all the way back from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel like I'm still even though I don't have my own, oh, I do have my own car now, my Riv, but, uh, you know, I feel like they're all kind of my car in a way, but I don't have to pay the uh, insurance or the registration on them. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I, I you know, to, again, all the way back to your question, yeah. you know, I don't really look at these as goals or, sure. like, they're benchmarks that we're lucky to have achieved in just addition to doing what we love. It's just icing on the cake if I think about it theoretically or logically, they're great for establishing our reputation yep. and legitimizing the shop. And hopefully, regardless of what type of car they're calling yep. about, it's going to create more business. And, and then you're able to select the customers that you want to do stuff for. You know, so I, I think I think about that more in retrospect than yep. like as a goal that I'm trying to achieve. It's maybe true for you guys, but like it, just for me personally, like when... I get I get turned off by people who are like who come out and say like someday I'm winning this right and <laughs> and for me it's like I never I never verbalize stuff like that and if if when I when you get to where you maybe achieve that thing that's where the satisfaction comes in but I my stomach turns when I hear and I don't know if it's the same for you but it's just like when somebody so I'm gonna win the effing Riddler someday it's like mm. if somebody I, I, yeah. you know yeah. and yeah, yeah. if so, as a builder uh, if a customer comes in and says I want to win this I, that's a huge red flag for yeah. me i don't ever build something or I've ne i never have built something with the intention of taking it to a specific award yeah. uh we our our calendar revolves around shows uh grand national roadster show and good guys pleasanton are two you know kind of touchstones halfway through the calendar that we sort of base everything on and then there's a bunch in between but i don't you know, I just said we're building the 68 Charger for the Sloniker. I don't mean we're trying to win. I really don't think we're going to win it. You and said that. Yeah. yeah. I really don't. And I, I, I mean that. You know, I've said that about certain awards that we have actually ended up winning. And I just am like, that's but it's, being in the right it, place at the right time. It's a great thing to go, I want to participate. Yeah. But yes. I don't have an expectation that's yeah. going to yes. crush my soul. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. approach is we're going to win the Sloniker. Yeah. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. The, 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 to me, tactful approach is we're going to go and be in the league. We're going to be in the conversation. It, it's all, uh, you know, I like the motto under promise and over deliver. And I try to do that with everything. I'd set realistic deadlines. I pride myself, you know, setting ourselves apart as a shop largely has been getting cars done period yep. and getting them done when we say we're going to get them done. It's a big yeah. deal. And I didn't, I, I was again, naive. That's just how you do things. Sure. And I, always had that perspective and didn't realize that I was setting myself apart the whole time. And Donnie, like Donnie, who has been with me the longest, he's like, I came to work at your shop because I saw you actually finishing cars. Oh, yeah. I've worked at a lot of, he, yeah. this yeah. is him quoting, yeah. I've worked at a lot of shops where I get, I work on something and I invest my emotion into it and it never sees the light of day. It never gets done. So, you know, that makes me proud in a way but i didn't even know that it was something to be proud of yeah, well goals get you there yeah and and but being realistic about those goals and not bringing a customer in 
enticing them with unrealistic goals. I, I can build this for X amount of dollars when it's half of what the thing's going to cost, or I can finish it by this show mm -hmm. yeah. when it's half the time it's going to take. Yeah, the, the free candy uh, windowless van of hot riding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on in. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, if I can just shift gears quite a bit. Um, you know, I love the history of Hot Rod Magazine. I know that John is invested in that. You know, Brian, you're a student of this. Yeah. You've lived so much of it. And I think of the stuff you've been involved in, the restorations and everything, but there's a car that I love that's hanging on your shop wall. Yeah. And it's the Lobuck Special, which your dad built in the pages of, it was Hot Rod, not Rod and Custom. Hot Rod, yeah. It was yeah. Hot Rod. Yeah, because and he had to do the, the uh, Floyd Lippincott exactly. back over his head. Yeah. Right. So the it's an altered, you know, Hemi drag car and everything. And at the time, Peterson didn't allow personal project vehicles in the pages. Yep. And so Pat did this with the help of a lot of other people and came up with Floyd Lippincott III, <laughs> the third, yeah. which is a throwback to Floyd Lippincott Jr., which is a name that Bob Baravez used to yep. avoid his parents knowing that he was driving yes. a dragster in the 60s. <laughs> yep. So there was that tie-in. Yep. And that car went away. Pat bought it back, right? Well, but we we bought it back. You did. Yeah. So, but well, both of us, I think we went halves on it. Okay. Uh, so it went to Sidney Allen's collection, who literally stored it uh, in his collection of cars museum, and that's why it it just was preserved wow. yeah, exactly mm. the way it was wow. in the eighties. Yeah. And uh, Sam Strube, yeah, he was driving who you know it. well. <laughs> yeah, he was driving it at Famoso when he, I saw the thing for the first time. That crazy MFR, yeah, literally with the old, the same tires on the front. He oh, put slits on here. the back. <laughs> yeah, the tires that are on the front of the car on my wall are the car tires that were on it in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, and he went out and basically just gunned it and ran like a nine five. <laughs> yeah, first time out on the track, and. My dad, you know, so when when he got it, of course, he told us and was like, hey, I, I got the car. It's super cool. He went in with, with another guy, a partner, but uh, Sam drove it. And uh, my dad was like, put a two-speed, put a trans in it. I mean, it's, you know, direct drive. It's just old, cheap. Right. I mean, literally, it's it's uh, the Lowbuck special. And then in quotes underneath, it says El Cheapo Especial. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> he built it. I mean, my dad's never made never made a dime in his life, really, to speak of. So everything was on a shoestring, but he just figured out ways to do these things. Uh, and the car, so Bob McRae drove it when he first built it. It was one of that Fremont comeback thing that your, your yeah, dad was, was just, so much involved in getting nostalgia drag racing yeah, off the ground. back into yeah. a thing. Absolutely, exactly, yeah. which is crazy to think. So in 80-whatever, it was only 20 years really right. gone. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And it was nostalgia. Yeah, the antique drags, yeah. right, yeah. is where they first kind of started. It, it was first labeled the, the antique drags at some of those races. That was a little bit of a different thing. Yeah. That was they ran a bunch of really old stuff then. It was right. bangers and yeah. flatheads yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like Which that. Which my dad was not for. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so it, it, it was, I mean, it was, I think it ran consistent low nines. I don't think it ever made it into the eights. I can't remember if it did or they were like real close, but um, it was just a fun atmosphere yeah. to going out to the drags and hanging out with, I mean, my dad got later did the Adams and Enriquez car yeah. and had Gene build the engine and tune it All and the Don originals. drove it. Yeah, I mean, and I think he was instrumental in bringing back the M and V, the Gray Basker. Absolutely, I remember Ernie the Hiroshi day. Car. I remember the day that they gave it to Gray. Yeah, and I've never seen Gray like sentimental before, but he was moved. Yeah, he was, and I was probably like, you Ten. know, twelve, yeah, yeah, something like yeah. that, super young, and I didn't appreciate what I was watching. Yeah, I remember it, and I'm glad I have the memories. But at the time just like why is this old man crying uh -huh. <laughs> and just sometimes i feel that we know what we're talking about yeah. and the audience doesn't necessarily gray baskerville was a guy who worked a hot rod and rod and custom starting in 1967 68 he yeah. got hired into the book division another mentor to me and in the 60s he and a guy named ernie murashigi and Paul Horning were involved in drag cars that were called the MNV, which was because Ernie ran MNV Automotive at the corner of Mary and Vernon in Pasadena, California. And anyway, they won 63 NHRA Nationals with that car don't, in class. Don't and pose that as a question to me. I am. That's, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking to you for that answer, but it's yeah. about right. 63 or 64. Somewhere, yeah, somewhere before. Yeah. It was definitely pre-65. If you so don't know, I don't know that okay. anybody knows. <laughs> that, that, yeah. It's about right. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, the car went away. And then in 1982 or three, 
your dad was a part of a bunch of people who got all together to build a recreation of yep. the car to surprise Gray with at one of these nostalgia yeah. races at Fremont. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Had the cool long headers and the whole deal. It's yeah. a really neat looking piece. And David and I spend way too much time inside the, the Peterson archive, the online photo archive. And yep. I was just rolling through whatever year it was. And that whole, I mean, there's hundreds of photos from that day in there. And it's, it's pretty, you can tell how much the moment meant. Not just to Gray, but really to all the guys that were there as well. All the guys. Shaporis. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man, I wish I could think of all the other people who were in the photo. It was fantastic. So the, the, the Gray Baskerville story that relates to my dad and, and that car ties everything together is that car was yellow. And it was a very specific shade of yellow. Like, uh -huh. I, you know, <laughs> and my dad had his 56 F100 that if you knew Pat, it's, it was just everywhere. He drove the out of it and it was at, he used it as the push truck for the low sure. buck and for the Adams Enriquez car. It was his parts getter. It was like his only car, really. I mean, he drove the VWs and the yeah. other things, but yeah. it was his signature. You saw that thing, you knew the two tall And it was, was bright there. yellow, so it yeah. stood out. Yeah, you mm -hmm. noticed it. So when, when around the time that the, the Gray's, they gave Gray the car, I remember Gray, you know, looking at my dad's truck at one point, and my dad, my dad would say, I think, that his favorite color was yellow. He liked yellow for some reason, but the truck was like kind of a, it was next to the gray, to Gray's car. It was like super pale and Gray was like, that's not yellow. That's yellow. <laughs> <laughs> and the next time my dad painted the truck, which he painted many, many times because yeah. he, you know, just over the years, it was a much darker shade of yellow. <laughs> <than> <laughs> <next> <laughs> time he painted it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, he told me a great story one time, which I'm sure you can fill in the actual details, but it was something like working in the driveway, moving the cars around, and he fired the truck up, which was in gear, which took off and hit the back of the Volkswagen, which rolled into the Roadster. Yeah. Oh. Is that about mm. accurate? That, so I will say that my dad's stories got uh, more hyperbolic <laughs> sure. as they went. <laughs> yeah. So you got one of the tail end of that <laughs> telling of that story. Right. I believe that, so as I remember it, it was his 52 Chevy that had the column shift on it, and he swears it was in neutral. Uh -huh. But the first time, he put a 283 in it. He finally got rid of the 6 because I think he couldn't get it to stop leaking oil. Uh -huh. So he <laughs> then he finally put a V8 in it. <laughs> but, yeah, he, he fired it up, and it ran into the back of his Roadster. It was only two cars that got it screwed up. Two, <laughs> yeah, it was well, three. <laughs> yeah, I heard four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and then it exploded like the gas station. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The whole, <laughs> he had to rebuild the whole yeah. garage yeah. after that. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I think this has been a really enlightening conversation, and, and sincerely thank you for taking the time to do this. We know your schedule at these events is crazy, and the fact you guys got to go out and celebrate and you still dragged your ass out of bed to come hang with us is a big deal. Oh, this is, I mean, like you got, we were talking about awards and everything, just the fact that you would ask me to come do a podcast with Dave Freiberger, and, you know, it's, I, it's surreal in a way I, I will always feel like the, kid who works at Brizio's, I think, for the rest of my career. It's a good thing. Uh, and, and just not to drag out, if you guys yeah. want to stop this, but at, at the, at the um, uh, awards last night, getting the, the Trendsetter Award, they named the people who'd gotten it previous. Mm. And it's like this list of names that I'm like, Your those heroes. are all my heroes. Yeah. What am I doing at the end of this list? You just disgraced the list. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> desecrated the whole yeah, thing. I know. Desecrated. Yeah. And I said that I said that to one of the SEMA people and their response was, Well, I guess you gotta get better. <laughs> 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 so I'm like, hey, that's not that's not inaccurate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's I look at all this as incentive to to really keep improving and, and, and doing it, I feel like it's an obligation uh, in a way to keep traditional hot rodding going uh and i really look to the people who came before us uh you know there's a lot of guys who are building cars out here who who don't know who gray baskerville is you know right yeah. and that makes me sad not mad but a little bit like you know i i wish people and and you got with hot rod you guys have been doing a really good job of bringing the historics back into play which i think is very very important you know, you're going to get some people who don't care and just turn right, past yeah. that yeah. page. But for the, the whatever percentage of the people who read that and, and have knowledge of where all of this came from, to me, it's, it's more than uh, just playing with cars. Mm -hmm. It's American culture. My yeah. dad always looked at this as culture, you know, as, as a 
sociology, you know. It is. More yeah. than just cars. And that might sound grandiose, but, you know, we're, we're, I, you know, I feel like we give meaning to what we feel like is meaningful. Mm -hmm. It doesn't inherently have meaning. It only has meaning if we uh, believe it has meaning mm -hmm. and remember the history of it and why we're here. So I just feel like it's, that's my, uh, my, the more you know moment. But that's, and also my dad having, you know, passed away, I never looked at what I do as like, you know, fulfilling a legacy or anything, but it just makes every, you know, it changed everything in a way mm -hmm. that's very poignant for me. Uh, you know, more than just losing my dad, all the knowledge that he oh, had. Incredible. Yeah. And it, 90 percent of it was in his head. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I think when I'm working at the shop and I don't know if it, that it will ever end. Whenever I had a question, I'd be like, oh, I got to call my dad. And yeah. I, that's never going to go away. And now it's just like, oh, now I got to call Dave Freiberger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Actually, what you could do if you're in the audience is you could probably go on Amazon and buy one of any number of books by Packet yes. G A N A H L. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the Lost Drag Strips books, mm -hmm. the, the Lost and Found Hot Rod stuff, yeah. the how to books on how to paint. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It goes way Runs back. Some, some of the stuff you'll need to find on eBay because it's out of print. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you can go back to the incredible tome of magazines that he contributed mm -hmm. to over the years. Roger Stern. I forgot to mention earlier. Yeah, yeah. He so. he would say he <laughs> he is very a very different person. I think behind the scenes than what a lot of people saw, you know, in the industry, so to speak. But you know, he was always afraid of of uh, you know losing his mental acuity, and so he would he would be like, uh, if he couldn't remember one person's name, he'd be like, oh my god, I'm getting Alzheimer's. Hey, it, this guy, <laughs> I, spent, I spent enough time with him that it's like he's channeling your father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've, you've but, literally just taken words out of his mouth. Yeah. Then just like David, he would go and rattle off 20 yeah. esoteric facts that nobody else knows. And he would mm -hmm. just be like, but yeah, why Brian couldn't I remember that, that guy's name? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, th that to me is like we look back and you can read historical books and these books are based on people's journals. Like that's how we know how people lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And – that doesn't exist anymore. You know, we have this electronic fashion that one day, one day the server could fry and, and, you, and everything's freaking gone. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, to your point, like I, it's, it's a, the cliche to th thing to say, but it's like, oh, we got to sit all these people down and get all these stories out of them. You just, no one has the time or whatever. But yeah, that to me becomes the titanic loss is, is when you lose the person, especially because of what's in the cranium. It is, mm -hmm. is just Pat's into, knowledge of the, the origins of hot rodding and especially yeah. customs, yeah. low riders. Oh man, lowriders another topic. I found out lowriders were okay because of your dad. Yeah. <laughs> you know. He after you know a lot of these things, some of them I knew, already knew and some you learn way after the fact is just how much people appreciated his open-mindedness. Yeah. People well. <laughs> I to a point. But well, but <laughs> I mean in re in relation to how very opinionated people think he was and he was in certain ways, but then he would surprise you in such a different thing and be like, oh, yeah, I, I love low riders and yeah, I want to yeah. promote them. And, you can and appreciate the whole. Yeah, he, he just was a very, aspect of the uh, you couldn't ever guess what was going to come out of his mouth. Was the, was the most important part of that if it was done well and it was done with some some respect to what the genre of it was didn't matter what the genre was but he could look at a low rider mm -hmm. and appreciate that this car was well constructed it was built with a, a clear thought process yes absolutely and more so or or in addition to that it is a whole culture that why are these separated you know it, it's a huge car culture and i think he was more like if it's got four wheels and it's custom, mm -hmm. why are we putting these boundaries between these things? He put a mini truck on the cover of the first swimsuit issue of Hot Rod. Yeah. Yeah. And which, whole other story That's about a whole the first, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. first Probably don't have issue. time for that one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I, I really appreciate uh, being involved. You know, I, I think I said after you allowed me, I asked if I could write the article for you Kobe's did. car yeah. um, because I like to write. I like yeah. to ju validate the fact that I went to college and wasted an entire <laughs> uh, college tuition. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I've now had cars on the cover 
mm -hmm. and articles written by myself mm -hmm. in every magazine that my dad worked for. Awesome. Wow. That's cool. And Except it really sunset. Except Sunset. You're right. <laughs> Damn it. You just destroyed his. <laughs> oh, this sorry. is the man's gift. This is David's, this is David's gift. So in, crushing. In, in moments, in, in, in these nice moments, you think you're enjoying a nice moment. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, wait. No, there's a fly in the suit. And to your point, it makes me feel like my dad is alive and well. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, now, like you said, you never really are have achieved your goal. Yeah. 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 I thought yeah. I had that one knocked knocked yeah. off, but yeah. fantastic. And on that crushing note, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a perfect way to end. Roll, roll the credits. Once again, Bill, thank you. Yeah, thank I mean, you guys. Yeah, you're. It's the depth of the depth of what you do. Like you know, we've we've, we've talked to other builders, and and to me, it's so much less about just like the high line stuff. I. I Understanding what motivates and drives you guys, and then understanding how you can make the business work, to me, is like, it's a fascination. Mm -hmm. It's two different talents, and a lot of people don't have both. Yeah. And I don't, know that, I don't know that I really have both. I'm just winging the business side of things, which a lot of people do, and somehow mm -hmm. I haven't crashed the business yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring me in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can do it. He can finish the job in no time sweat, no time flat. Well, yeah. Guys, anything, anything else you want to throw in? No. Good stuff. Yeah. I love reminiscing, and I love what you're doing for the future. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I do want to say your English degree didn't go to waste. Yes. I, lo I loved the article you wrote. I've never let uh, a car builder write their own car feature before, ever. Yeah. Uh, that's not something we do. But I, I, I told Bill after I read it that um, I'd hire you in a second. Like, <laughs> I, I wish you could <laughs> stop what you're doing and help me out with the – because well, we, we read a lot of bad writing. <laughs> Yeah, we need a lot of bad writing. So <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah, I'll take so. that as a huge compliment. Thank you, thank you. And yeah. and I did interview to work for the magazines at one point in the middle of my tenure at Brizio's, and I feel no offense to anyone here <laughs> that I was very fortunate I didn't take that job <laughs> at building cars. Yeah, we all feel yeah. the same way. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you make us look bad as a right as writers, you no, make no. us look bad anyway. But no, it, it it all seems to be working out. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's going to bring us to the end of this episode of the Hot Rod Pod, where it all began. Once again, big thanks to Bill, big thanks to David, big thanks to John. We'll be back with more shows here from SEMA. we got more people to talk to, and this series is just getting started.